This is SBN3E, Grade 11 Workplace Science, and I am the teacher, Bronwyn Slate. If you'd like to participate live, you can call the WASA Studio at 1-800-465-7144 or 737-4017. You can listen on the radio at 91.9 FM and also on the television at Bell Express View Channel 972. You're always welcome to join live through the Zoom link, which is available both from me, your teacher, and also your DEC. Our classes are scheduled from Monday through Thursday, 10 to 11 in the morning, and we are in our eighth week of our nine-week course. At this point, you need to be submitting work for marking to stay on track with finishing the course next week. So a reminder that each of the IELTS lessons has a list of the key questions at the end. So you need to do all of these questions. Some are check your understanding questions, some are activities, some are review questions. So you need to do them all, explaining your ideas and thoughts in complete sentences and making sure you're actually answering the question. You can do this by hand or electronically, whatever works best for you. If you're gonna do it by hand or Either way, you can write in your workbook, it is yours, but the spaces at the end for the review questions in particular are very small. So I'd strongly encourage you to write those on a separate piece of paper to hand in, just to have enough room to give complete ideas. If you're gonna do it electronically, PDF, Word, and Google Doc files are the easiest for us to open. All students have access to Google Doc files through their NNEC email address, which we can support you to access if you need help. So how do you actually submit your work for marking? Well, the first method is to send it electronically. If you've done it by hand, you can scan your completed work through a device. Apple devices have a notes app with a scan function and Android devices have a Google Drive app with a scan function. These are free apps that generally come with the devices, though you can just download them again for free if need be. I have a tech tutorial on my YouTube channel with for each of these that you can use if you need to learn how to do this, or you can also ask for help and we're happy to help. Then you can send it to us through email to studentwork at nnec.on.ca and you want to CC it to John. I no longer am marking for this course. I will instruct for the remainder of this week and next week, but then the course is completely responsible to John. So you want to connect with him for your work. His email address is jstradiotto at nnec.on.ca. The second method is to hand your work to us in Sue Lookout. We have a outdoor mailbox at our location 74 Front Street. We are the bright red building next to the post office and we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance. The third method is to hand your work into your DEC. So your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1738. Or toll free fax to 1-800-463-7852. You can also connect with us through social media if you'd like. Both my Facebook and my YouTube channel are under the name B Slate Wasa. So you can subscribe to my YouTube channel or friend me on Facebook, even though I am not marking for this course, you can still connect with me and I'm happy to support you however I can. All of our radio Zoom classes are recorded and are still useful even though I'm not marking. I put them on YouTube and under a playlist called SVN3E, so they're all e they're easy for you to find. Also, there is a playlist with supplementary videos for all the videos that we've watched in class that are available through YouTube 
are all linked in there. So you can check that out if you want to find things from the original sources. Science is a really visual subject. And so I strongly encourage you to access the videos. I incorporate as many outside videos, diagrams, graphics, charts, things like that in my lessons as possible to really give us a full picture of what we're talking about. So just listening to it isn't going to give you the richness of the course opposed to watching the videos. If you can't join me live through Zoom or access the YouTube videos, you don't have reliable internet or something like that, let me know. I'm happy to send you a copy of the videos so that you can take it from there. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to us here at WASA. We are here to support you. That is our primary goal. So let us know. You can email me at bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca, or you can email John at jstradiotto at nnec.on.ca. You can connect, connect with me through Facebook at bslatewasa, or you can call us at the office at 807-737-1488 or toll free 1-800-667-3703. My extension is 2209 and John's extension is 2210. So please reach out to us if you need support. It's important for me to position myself within the context of education as my experience as a learner shapes how I am as a teacher. I have white settler ancestry, I have white privilege, and this means that my experience of education has not, has as many barriers as many other folks have with my white, our educational institution is structured such that those with white privilege have an easier time than those who do not have white privilege. That is part of the definition of white privilege is that our systems are in place to make it easier for us. Uh, I live in Northwestern Ontario on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe people. And I work to integrate the culture and traditions that are appropriate into our coursework so that we can understand um, more than the one perspective of the white perspective. But as an educator, I have lots to learn and unlearn. And this is a lifelong journey that I am continuing to work on and prioritize, but it, I don't get it right all the time. So if you have feedback for me, I welcome it, though I recognize that that is emotional labor and time that many folks do not have the capacity for, and I understand that completely. Our textbook is also Eurocentric. It positions the European ideal, the white ideal, and it focuses on white communities when it gives examples. Uh, this is highly problematic as it only presents one view of environmental science, and this is, it weighs things differently than other perspectives. It ignores Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis knowledges and experiences, and this is disappointing and frustrating as there's a wealth of knowledge from these communities that our textbook ignores, and therefore it's hard to dive into in this course as our course is structured on that material. I work again to incorporate what I can into our course material and I'd hoped to find another resource, but I have not been able to. Also, once I'm no longer responsible for this course, it's not gonna be within my scope um, to look for a other textbook, but hopefully WASA will continue to commit to finding more appropriate resources. All right, so we are continuing to talk about natural resources today. We remember in our previous lesson, we talked about uh, just the context of like how water is so important to everyone, to humans, us bases, we need water. Um, and United Nations are fighting for it to be a human right that is protected by international law, which would improve things for many people, Indigenous communities, particularly here in Canada, as Indigenous communities, many Indigenous communities do not have access to safe, clean drinking water um, and have to ship it in and use bottled water, um, which is just not okay. So this is something that many people are fighting for globally. 
Today's lesson is 22, and we're going to be looking at the methods of extracting Canada's natural resources. In our previous lesson, we looked at what our natural resources are and the wealth of them, and which is focused on a colonial perspective of the value of these resources being the financial value, what we can sell them for, and what profit we can make financially and economically. And so today's lesson is looking at the extraction of these resources in order to do that, in order to make profit, in order to have financial wealth, as we are live in a capitalist system and think that that is the most important thing as a society. And so that is where our textbook takes us. Again, this is a really clear, obvious example of how the textbook is Eurocentric and how it's putting the most value on financial wealth opposed to the other elements that our natural resources are beneficial and uh, valued for. So our learning goals are that at the end of this lesson, you'll be able to describe common methods of resource extraction in Canada, and you will understand the environmental issues with each method. You know you've met the learning goals because you can explain various methods of commercial fishing and their consequences. You can explain various methods of logging and their consequences, and you can explain different methods of mining, salt, and their consequences. So we have learned about Canada's different natural resources. For every type of natural resource, there are many ways to extract or remove it for human use. We will explore some extraction methods for commercial fisheries, forest, forestry, and salt. Obviously, there's other resources that we've discussed that are extracted, but these are the ones we're gonna focus on in this lesson. So first, let's look at commercial fishing. Gill netting and purse, Seening are is one method of commercial fishing. So most commercial fishing methods target fish for direct human consumption and rely on different types of nets and lines. Two examples of these methods are gill netting and purse seening. So here you can see a diagram of gill nets. So these are nets where fish get caught in them because they try to swim through them and their gills get caught and they can't back out and they can't go through anymore. So there's ones that are set on the ground um, and then there's ones that are dragged behind boats. Then persining is this big net that is dragged behind a boat that goes around and captures the fish and then closes kind of like a purse. Um, so there's like a drawstring type thing that pulls and then they pulls the fish into the boat. Gill nets are long flat nets that are hung vertically in any depth of water using a combination of weights at the bottom and buoyant floats at the top. They become almost invisible of an invisible fence that fish cannot see. The spaces of the nets are made just big enough to fit the heads of the targeted fish so that when they swim into the net and try to back out, they become entangled by their gills. They're used to catch fish like herring, flatfish, and small pelagic fish, the ones living in the upper layers of the open, open sea. So here, looking closely at, here is a diagram that shows what it looks like the fish going through. Um, and here you can see it in real life. People pulling in the gill lines up and all the fish being caught uh, their heads through and they're caught on their gills um, and tangled into these nets. So purse is the fishing method of encircling a school of fish with a large wall of net. The net is drawn together underneath the fish like a drawstring purse so they cannot escape. The net is then pulled aboard the boat. Today's seating boats are very powerful being equipped with large nets and hydraulic winches. They're used to catch tuna, mackerel and herring. So here again, we can look at our diagram and we can see a drawing that shows the boat and the big huge net that goes down and then Here's you can sort of see it in action so that the boat goes around the fish, drops the, the net, and the net 
captures the fish and draws it and pulls it in. Uh, here you can see it in real life. This is the net has already been pulled up. It's pulling pull up into the boat and you can see all of these thousands of fish inside the net. And then it's gonna be pulled up in this diagram. You can see it's gonna be pulled up by these strong hydraulic machines and then dumped into the boat. So the problem with both of these methods is of bycatch mortality. When commercial fishing methods bring in valuable catches, they are not always the most sustainable way of extracting the resource. One of the major problems with many commercial fishing methods is bycatch mortality. Bycatch are the non-targeted fish, marine mammals, turtles, and marine diving birds that are caught. They're usually discarded from commercial fishing nets and traps and many of them die. So here you can see is a, a diagram for a campaign in California that is saying the an end to drift gill nets. And you can see how these nets are, have a whale, a shark and a turtle all caught in them. And that means that they can't move to breathe. Like whales need to come above ground to breathe as do turtles. Um, and I think turtles do. Actually, I don't know if these types of turtles do. I don't know. Um, or they can't catch, they can't eat because they're trapped there so that they die. So a solution for this is selective fishing, which decreases bycatch mortality. One of the sustainable fishing practices used to decrease bycatch mortality is called selective fishing. Selective fishing targets a particular fish species while avoiding to release, while avoiding or releasing non-targeted fish species unharmed. So that's key. Not just that they're releasing them, but that they're unharmed. Selective fishing involves modifying conventional fishing methods. So selective per scene nets are made to allow small fish to escape without being brought on board the boat so that they fit through the holes in the net so they can get out before being brought into the boat and then dying because they can't breathe anymore. A selective gill netting uses a wheel line to lower the top edge of the net by one or two meters below the water surface so that the non-target fish species can pass overhead unharmed. Dip nets and underwater revival cages are used to revive, retrieve and store bycatch species before they return to the water. So those are some of the methods of commercial fishing. We're gonna watch a short video about the problem of overfishing. You may have heard about this. It's sort of the classic conversation about overfishing when we're talking about sustainable methods of fishing. Um, and also just in general, in terms of natural resources being over uh, harvest as the case of the Atlantic cod. So this is just to talk about why it's important to have these selective methods, have these alternative methods that are sustainable, because what are the impacts are in terms of the long term impacts on an animal or a, a resource if we are not harvesting it sustainably. It sounds like the stuff of legends, but to veteran fishermen off New England's coast, it was the real deal. Codfish so plentiful that it served as the cornerstone of the region's economy. Today, however, New England fishing is nothing like it was even 30 years ago. Older fishermen say those were the days when fat cod seemed to fill the ocean. All you had to have was a boat, and you could follow anybody you wanted and sat around them and catch fish. It was that simple. I would go out here 25 miles and come in with 5,000 pounds of fish every day. Every fish, you could barely roll them over with your wrist, barely roll them over to cut them. They were so big, they would use, I mean, average probably 35 to 40 pounds, every fish. It was the most fantastic fishery, the most fantastic thing I ever saw. Old salts do like to tell stories, but these are not exaggerations. If you didn't see any cod down there, you would throw the line out to one side and, and just keep bring it back and the whole school would come back to you. It was, that's how thick they were. But by the 1980s, the fleets had grown bigger and much more powerful. 
with added technologies like side scan sonars, GPS systems, and fish finders. Scientists and fishermen had begun to notice that individual cod were getting smaller and that cod populations were shrinking and disappearing from inshore areas. We did all fish, and that's where they went. Then I mean, the fish couldn't stand up to the technology. It made fishermen out of people. I mean, technology made fishermen out of people who couldn't really find their way in the ocean, but you know, if you have everything. By some accounts, the fish were changing their behavior as well in ways that made it easier to catch them. They stopped spreading out across the bottom. They bunched up. Um, and the scientists say it's a survival technique, but it's the worst possible thing they could have done. The fleets searched out these hot spots in the water and practiced something called pulse fishing. Pulse fishing that I've defined it is when a lot of boats hit a population of fish, fish it very hard to a point where it's either depleted or collapsed, and then simply moves on to another. At the time, no one knew that many of these hot spots were essential breeding grounds for cod, or that when the hot spots were fished out, it would take decades to rebuild them. So we caught the big ones, caught the little ones, and then we're turning around and blaming everybody. Uh, everybody is turning around and blaming everybody else that uh, they were the problem. In the 1990s, cod counts hit their lowest point in recorded history just 12% of the level thought to be necessary to sustain a healthy population. It wasn't very long before we had wiped it out, but there's been no fish up inside of the 20 or 30 miles from shore for, like I said, 15, 20 years. Today there are some signs of recovery, and it could be better still, according to the old salts. If we heed the science and protect the spawning fish, they say this recovery will grow and spread. I really think that science needs to take over. But we need to start listening to science. And if that happens, there is a chance that Cape Cod will once again live up to its name. We can do it. It can be done. I know it can be done. There's a lot of brilliant people. If we send somebody to the moon, we sure as hell can and fix this fishery. So that just shows the impact of over-harvesting a natural resource and how not only did the, the size of the cod dramatically decrease, but also the number of cod uh, is significantly depleted and because fishermen were just catching everything, then populations weren't able to repopulate. And therefore, now still decades later, we are still trying to recover from that. So it's just a very clear example of why we need to be conscious. So things that have happened um, in a response to this kind of things to think about how can we do better. Uh, Aquatic culture has developed for many reasons. So this is open net cage fish farms. So one of these growing of the growing concerns about shrinking fish stocks is due to overfishing, like we just saw. Fish farms have been operating in Canada since the 1970s and provide an alternative to harvesting wild fish stocks. However, some forms of fish farming, like open net cage fish farming, can threaten wild fish stocks. With open net cage farming, Open cages are used to raise fish like salmon in coastal waters that are then sold internationally. Open net cage fish farms threaten wild fish stocks and marine habitats in many ways. Waste, fish waste from, and fish feed, often containing drugs and pesticides, pollute surrounding waters. Sea lice and disease can spread from farm fish to wild stocks. Farm fish can escape their nets and threaten native wild fish. Many environmental organizations believe that fish farming must move away from using open net cages to close containment systems that prevent escapes and the spread of diseases and pollution. So envir uh, environmentalists are not saying that fish farms are 100% completely a bad idea, but just them being open and able to have things affect the natural environment is concerning. All right, so now, 
you can answer the questions on page 179, the check your understanding questions one and two. Let's look at forestry. So silver culture systems is the variety of ways that forests are managed for timber and habitat, wildlife conservation and recreation. They cover all the decisions that go into maintaining a forest stand from planning to harvesting to replanting and tending growth. There are two major types of silver silviculture systems, even aged and uneven aged. Even aged systems are relatively small age differences between individual trees. These are like clear cut systems and shelter wood systems. Uneven age systems, trees are, have a various age. So this is a selection system. So let's look at these into more detail. So clear cut systems are used for stands of trees that require full sunlight to thrive. These are shade intolerant trees. For example, poplar, white birch, spruce. It is meant to resemble a large natural disaster disturbance. This is, the reality is, is that uh, natural disasters happen, forest fires happen, tornadoes happen, things happen that wipe out forests and then the forests recover and have a similar aged system um, because all the trees are recovering from the same thing and are growing at the same rate. Uh, so clear cuts systems are trying to resemble that similar pattern. All the trees are selected in a selected area of a stand are removed, whether in blocks, strips, or patches. Forest debris like stumps and branches are left in place to provide nutrients for soil development and habitats for animals and other plants. So those things are going to decompose and return back to the soil. Areas of uncut forests are also left along rivers, lakes, and areas important for wildlife. Once an area is clear cut, it is left to grow freely for 60 to 120 years until it is mature and ready for reharvest. Clear cutting results in a new even aged forest. Here are some examples of clear cutting. Uh, there are pros and cons um, to all of these things. It's not a simple, this is always terrible, this is always good. I have some images that show just the, the impact of cutting old growth forests. So just these huge, huge trees that are cut um, compared to these individual person. Obviously this person did some sort of uh, tracking of where they were cutting down trees and went to take pictures before and after. Um, and you can see here some aerial views of forests that are clear cut, these big patches, these big swaths of trees being cut, and then the growth as they're trying to re recover um, and repopulate. So the shelter wood system the trees in a stand are removed in stages over a short period of time to promote the growth of an even aged new stand under the shelter of the old one. So this system is aimed at protecting and sheltering new growth after trees have been cut. It aim, also aims to mimic natural disturbances like wind, fire, and insects that leave large gaps in a forest canopy. It is used with mid-tolerant trees that grow in partial shade, as saplings but also need some sunlight to grow like oak, ash, and hemlock. So here is an example of the cycle of fir shelter wood. So we have a mature even age stand of mid-tolerant trees. We do they do a prep cut where the first cut is done when trees are 60 to 80 years old. It opens up the crown. So here you can see that these trees are being cut out. These ones that are now white, those are now space. Um, so it removes disease trees and competing species like white birch and poplar to give space for them to grow. Then we can see we have a seed cut. So now the forest has more room to grow. This cut is performed when trees are 80 to 100 years old and opens the crown to about 50% of cover and leaves the best seed bearing trees. The seed cut may be combined with a prep cut. So now that means that they're dropping, these trees are gonna drop seeds to help these next level you can see are the trees are now starting to grow back. So we have our first removal. When a dense carpet of seedlings has become established, about half of the remaining stems are removed. So these big trees are then cut. 
This creates a partial sunlight condition required for seedling development. So the seeds need to have both shade and sun um, to grow. And then our final removal is the majority of the remaining mature trees are removed to release the young trees that have been established. So then we have thinning and tending over time to improve just the, the stand of trees. And then we're back to the beginning of where these trees are now matured um, and can cycle again. So here are some images of this. So we have a diagram where we can see the original uncut stand. Um, then 15 years after establishment, once they've cut and there's trees have grown back. And then 40 years after establishment, as we can see, it's very back to very something similar to what it was to begin with. And you can see how it looks in from different perspectives in terms of uh, at ground level, at aerial sort of looking up. Um, and just where we have stumps and logs so that there's sunlight and space to, for new, these new little seedlings to grow. Then we have a selection system, which is mostly used for shade tolerant hardwood forests, which makes up much of central Ontario. Shade tolerant hardwoods like beech and sugar maple are able to grow in well shaded understory beneath the forest canopy. This aims to mimic minor natural disturbances like wind and disease and produces an uneven age stand. So here we can see we have a mature, mature tolerant hardwood forest. So there's various trees of various heights. So the first cut has the overmature and poor quality trees up to 30% of the total are marked and then cut. So things that are not healthy. After 20 to 30 years, the remaining trees that have thrived in the next generation is well established. So then we have a second cut where 30% of the mature keys are cut, focusing on the removal of poor quality trees. So the same idea, cut out the not healthy ones and leave the healthiest to grow. And then another 20 to 30 years, then another third will be removed. So this continues is that you're going through and you select out uh, some of the trees that are not as healthy and are biggest are creating, uh, taking up the most space and then that leaves room for the younger ones to grow. So here we can see uh, some images. Obviously it's kind of hard to see this over time, um, but we have some diagrams where you can see where the, the ones that are dead have been cut out. Um, the really, they don't, the images don't look that different because there's constantly big trees and little trees um, and are just different things are getting pr like pruned out. So you can see that here, these trees have been marked and there are gonna be ones that are gonna cut down first as these new little ones can grow another diagram just showing the different, the various different ages and types of trees that grow um, and how you can have stumps and big trees and little trees all in the same area. So there's advantages and disadvantages to all three of these um, methods to clear cutting, shelter wood logging and selective cutting. So this is in your um, booklet. There are economic advantages for clear cut systems. So it allows for easier and effective harvesting operations since all the trees are removed, you just go in and cut everything down. Um, it's safer for workers because again, all the trees are removed and harvesting is less expensive because there's a higher volume per hectare removal. So the timber can be sold at a competitive price, but there's environmental disadvantages. So with clear cutting, the Cutting all the trees damages the entire forest ecosystem, changes it to a farm-like conditions where trees are replanted in a planned uniform manner. It's not suitable to wildlife that thrive in habitats with overhead cover, may cause erosion and water runoff into streams and lakes, and there's no ground cover which causes warming and cooling of errors, changing those microclimates. So clear cutting is strong for economic and not great for environmental. Shelterwood has economic disadvantages because it requires more skill and time to regenerate the forests. It requires more skill and time to cut the trees. So harvesting is more expensive and more expensive harvest means cost is passed to the timber consumer. Environmentally, there are both advantages and disadvantages. It's less disruptive to forest habitats to do a shelterwood system. It protects new growth of forests. Seeds from trees are left standing, will help regenerate the area and there's less soil erosion and water runoff, but there's disadvantages because specific areas of the forest ecosystem are disturbed and change microclimates that affect the wildlife and the plant habitats. 
then selection system has the greatest economic disadvantages. Again, it requires more skill and time to regenerate the forest as well as to cut the trees. So therefore the harvesting is more expensive, which means that the cost is passed on to the timber consumer. The advantages are that harvesting only mature trees of desired size, type, and quality. It's less destructive to forest habitats and associated fish spawning, nesting, and wild ha wildlife habitats. There's less soil erosion and water runoff. There's a less effect on microclimate climates. So now you're able to answer the key questions on forestry on page 182, questions one and two. And finally, let's look at industrial minerals. Specifically, we're looking at salt. So industrial minerals are non-metallic minerals that are used to, in construction, manufacturing, and chemical industries. So when we're talking about mining, we often think about like gold and iron and those shiny things, but there's also minerals in the ground that are non-metallic that are have we have value on. So manufacturers rely on industrial minerals like silica, limes, and limestone to produce plastics, glass, and ceramics. In construction, shale is used to make bricks. Salt is used to flavor our food, but also to de-ice roads and soften water. It is also a raw material used in chlorine chemical processes that produce everything from soap to digital cameras. Salt has 14,000 known uses. So salt is something we use a lot of. Canada salt deposits are found in three major rock formations. In Ontario, salt is found along the shores of Lake Huron and Lake Erie. The deposits are part of the saucer-shaped geological structure known as the Michigan Basin that underlines much of southwestern Ontario. These salt formations lie at depths of up to 825 meters below the surface, and the salt beds can be up to an over 20 meters, sorry, 200 meters thick. Two major methods are used to extract salt in Canada, underground room and pillar mining and brining. So room and pillar mining is a conventional mining method usually used to extract relatively flat lying blanket deposits. It is used to mine other natural resources such as coal, iron, stone, and potash too. Room and pillar mining extracts material across a horizontal plane while leaving pillars of untouched material to support the open areas of rooms that are mined underground. Rock salt can be mined in this way up to depths of around 600 meters. In a salt mine, a vertical shaft is sunk to the salt to lower workers and machinery used to haul out crushed rock salt. The rooms in a mine can be 9 to 15 meters wide. Around 40 to 60 percent of the salt must be left as pillars to support the roof of the mine. So here, let's look at a picture to really understand what we're talking about. Is that so we have at some point we have a shaft. We don't see the shaft here, but we are sending these workers and machines down. And then this here, this gray part, we have sliced it out so that we can see, but generally this is all like it is over here, solid ground. And these little tunnels, these little rooms are carved out and the rock salt is carved out and shipped out in these trucks. And, but then there's pillars left here to keep all of this ground above so it doesn't collapse. So here you can see in actual real life example, you can see this is a room and then these are the pillars that are holding the ceiling up as they move forward and around to different areas where they are extracting rock salt. So then brining is when water is injected into salt deposits lying at depths of up to a thousand meters. The resulting brine or salt saturated solution is pumped to the surface, then transported by pipeline to evaporating plants that use steam heat to dry out the brine to make salt. It can also be taken to chemical processing plants where the brine solution is used to manufacture chlorine, caustic soda, and other industrial chemicals. Only about one quarter of Canada's salt is brined and most of this is used in chemical manufacturing. So here you could see uh, some examples. So here, this diagram, we are pumping water in 
to the rock salt, which is underground, and then that dissolves the rock salt. And then we pump out the brine, which then we have here in areas where the water is evaporated and the salt is left and then processed to be used however it's going to be used. And that covers our lesson 22 today. So again, the focus of today's lesson was methods for extracting Canada's natural resources, where we talked about those three different examples. And the primary focus of extracting these resources is for financial gain, which we can have a whole debate about if that is really what we should be doing. And that is uh, how we can be doing this effectively and sustainably, which we talked a little bit about, but not a ton about. Um, so it's something to sort of look into further. So we did talk about commercial fishing and how there are advantages and disadvantages of gill netting, purse seining, and fish farms, and how these can also be all problematic in terms of having a impact on the environment as a whole. We talked about forestry with the silviculture systems, and again, the advantages and disadvantages. Um, generally, we're comparing comparing the advantages and disadvantages in contrast of economic and environmental. Most often you do not have economic advantages and environmental advantages. Uh, usually they are in conflict opposed to simultaneously both being positive. And then industrial mi minerals, we looked at salt and we really just briefly looked at the room and pillar mining and the brining as different methods for salt. Um, mining, we didn't really look so much at the advantages and disadvantages, but that's something that we can look into further if you're interested. So hopefully you can now explain the various methods of commercial fishing and their consequences, the various methods of logging and their consequences, as well as the methods of mining salt and their consequences. So you can do the review questions on page 185, questions one through 14, which dive into each of these three things. And then you are covered, you've completed lesson 22. So we have one more lesson, 23 is our last lesson for the new context content for this course. And then our remainder time will be review. Uh, we will have another throwback Thursday this week. And then next week in our final week, we will go back and reviewing all of our uh, topics from the beginning, we will have a couple of days, uh, or each day will cover a couple of units so that we can really make sure we understand everything that we've talked about in preparation for your final assignments. If you have any questions, please reach out to us here at WASA. You can contact me either through calling or emailing or Facebook. Uh, you can call at the toll free number at 1 800 667 3703. And my extension is 2209. You can email me at bronwyn.slate, and that's spelled B R O N W Y N dot S L A T E at N N E C dot O N dot C A. All of our lessons are up on YouTube, where my channel is B Slate Wasa. Remember, they're all found under the playlist M E L 3. Sorry, not that. That's my math playlist, S V N 3 E. My apologies. The playlist is S V N 3 E. That is the science, environmental science course code. If you want to connect with John the Marker, his email address is jstradiotto at nnec.on.ca. You can also call him at the toll-free number or the local number at 807-737-1488. His extension is 2210. And he's here to help you however you need it. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have a lovely day and we will talk to you soon. Which?